know if we plant the seed, you water it, God. These things we pray to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dwight. If you want to join me in my scripture, I'll let you be turning to James 1. As I look across the uh, sanctuary today, I see that we all grew up at different times. Uh, therefore, our image of our Father probably is a little quite different with, uh, throughout the, the congregation. For a person born in a uh, rural area before 1940, there was a great deal of work that had to be done. So your image of your Father is one who was working all the time and required you to work quite a bit. Uh, if you grew up during the 50s, not, uh, the, your father or grandfather was likely a veteran of World War II. Uh, and as someone getting back into the workforce uh, after being in uh, World War II and or uh, the, uh, the Korean War. But in the 1950s and early 1960s, there were many more motorized helps into the country. Even though it, was, it, it had been temporarily at peace until the Korean War came along, uh, as important as that war was, it did not affect the nation like World War II had affected the nation. So there was still family time. If you grew up during the 60s and 70s, then your father was one who wanted peace. Uh, they had either fought in one of the recent wars or they had a father who had fought. And they were a father who worked a lot and went to the lake on Saturdays and hopefully they went to church on Sunday. But in the 1980s, brought a whole new picture of dad. If dad was 18 years of age or older from 1968 to 1977, the world completely revolutionized. And dad was nothing like his grandfather for the most part, and his, uh, especially if they had lived in the city. But we are going to learn today about our heavenly father and learn how he loves and provides for us each and every day. Grateful for the fathers that are that are here today. Grateful for uh, uh, the fathers that, that trained us up in the way of war. Very grateful for that. Unfortunately, a positive and wonderful father image is not held by everyone with, that we are associated with or that we may work with. Um, unfortunately, because of, of the way that they may have been reared. But we're going to turn and look at several passages today. Quite a number. And let's begin in James 1, please. James 1, and I'd like to read uh, 16 through 18. Uh, we're going to have a study today of who God is for us as, as God our Father. Who is God to us as God our Father? Please look on at, at verse 16 through 18. Do not be deceived. My, my beloved brethren, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So let me begin with, with this and with the truth that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Have you ever heard of the word phosphate? The Greek word uh, here in this word light is phosphos, the root word for, the phos for phosphate. So the word means light. God is a point of light in the darkness. God literally pierced the world's darkness with the truth that he brings. You do number one, please, Kevin. Not only, but God gave us the greatest blessing of all by sharing His only begotten Son, the second person of the Trinity, who has broken the darkness with the salvation of truth that brings us into that right relationship with God. He is the Father of lights, the source of all light. He not only created light, but He is the source of all knowledge, all hope, intellect, understanding, love, mercy, kindness, and he is the light of moral and spiritual darkness. As a matter of fact, Revelation tells us that God lives in a light so terrible that mere man could not exist in his presence. So God is the father of lights. 
Not only is he the father of lights, but more importantly, God is our creator, right? You probably don't need to turn over to Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Uh, I'm going to have it on the screen. I'd really like for you to quote it with me, either in your Bible at Genesis 1, 1 through 5, or on the screen. I'm going to invite you to, to read out loud with me. Beginning now. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God is our heavenly Father because he is our creator. Also go with me now to Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is an incredible passage, maybe one of the greatest acts of faith in the entire Bible. Genesis 22, 9. 9 through 14. Look on there as I, as I read, please. Then they came to the place where God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there, and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar of the top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his, his hand and took the knife and slayed his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He's, he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Jehovah is a name that was given during the Latin Vulgate. Or Yahweh is the more correct name. That is the name of God referred to himself as Yahweh or, or as we've got interpreted Jehovah. But Jehovah, the name of Jehovah with the name that we have come to understand as Jireh is interpreted as God who provides. Or literally it means the Lord who sees or the Lord who has seen to it. So Jehovah Jireh is God is our provider. He watches over us every day. He knows our needs before we know our needs. He is ready to hear us and he's ready to bless us. God protects us and provides more for us than we will ever know. So God is the one who will see to it that we are taken care of. For instance, how many times in your heart have you needed a particular thing? And you uh, maybe not even prayed for it, but you began to look for it, and all of a sudden it was easily found by you. Or you uh, were terribly thirsty, and someone offered you a drink. There, there's no telling how many times God has blocked a car from hitting us. And there's no telling how many burglars God has chased away from our doors. God is our provider. God is our Father, and He is our El Shaddai. What does that mean? I'm going to go to Genesis 17. Go back to Genesis 17 and read there, please. Kathy will help us with the screen. Beginning 1 through 6, verses 1 through 6. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I, will, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will, and I will make nations of you. 
and kings shall come forth from you. You can absolutely trust God, church family, to win the day. The word here is, is uh, in Hebrew, is Shaddai, and it means most powerful. So God, our Father, is most powerful. And every one of us go through terrible storms. And you can be assured that God is going to provide for you. He is, he is the most powerful God. He is our provider. He is our Father. And He will see us through our circumstances. Almost exactly five years ago today, I stood with a pastor friend who was making the horrible decision to release his wife off of life support. I called in other pastors to come join me and pray for him. It was a terrible time for him. And I took food to a lady um, along about that same time, about five years ago, who, who uh, told me that after her second time in the hospital with an infected knee, that she would, she would have to lose her, her leg in order to save her life if an infection is not cleared up, is not brought under control, that we're going to have to take her leg. These are terrible storms of life that we have to face. Hopefully we'll never have to face that kind of serious decision, but unfortunately some of us in this room will have to make a bad, a tough decision, a really tough decision about a loved one or even about ourselves in order to, to move forward in our life. But God is always going to be there with us. He is going to provide for us he is our Jehovah Jireh, and He is our Almighty God, so He is our El Shaddai. But gratefully, God our Father is also our healer. He is our Jehovah Rapha. Turn one book over to Exodus, please. Exodus 15, uh, to be more exact. And Exodus 15, in verse 22 to 26. Is all we're going to read. 22 through 26. And I'll read for you. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah, uh, for they were bitter waters. Therefore it was named Marah. So the, so the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he knew it, he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them the statue and and statute and regulation. And there he tested them. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes. <laughs> I will put none of the diseases on you, which I shall put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, am your healer. I am the Lord, am your healer. So God is our, our Jehovah Rapha. And there are many, many verses in, uh, in the Bible, of course, about God healing. And, and you can turn over to uh, Numbers 21. And you can see there how God... Uh, Listen to Moses' prayer and save the people from these vipers that had come in among them and was killing them. God had told Moses to make a snake on a pole. And, and Moses lifted that snake up on the pole. And by the people looking upon that snake, God told them that by their faith in what God said, they would be healed. And again in Numbers 25, there was a large number of people dying from a plague. But God instructed Moses what to do for the plague to stop. And when he did, God stopped the plague. Every one of us in here many times over has called on God to heal us. And he has. For God the Father is our provider, our almighty God. And he is our healer. Turn with me now to Exodus 17. Just, just a couple of chapters over. In chapter 17, verse 8 through 15. I'll read 8 through 15. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go down and fight against Amalek. Today I will, tomorrow, 
will station myself at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did, as Moses told him, and fought against Amalek and Moses, Aaron and Hur, went up to the top of the hill. And so it came about, Moses held in his hand up, that Moses, that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand was heavy. <clears throat> then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Ur, Hur, uh, supported his hands, uh, one on one side and one on the other side. Uh, thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in your book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the sun. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. God the Father is our Jehovah Nissi. He is our banner. You see, all the way back to these Egypt times, people fought under a, a common flag or an emblem of the flag. So the Hebrews were wanting to fight under their own flag, but Moses said no. Moses said, God is our banner. He is our Jehovah Nissi, our banner, and we fight under his authority. It's my opinion, anyway, that we have sanitized and made our world so politically correct that we don't want our children to hear the words of war or the effects that come from, from people's misguided guilt. But the truth is, we fight a war every day. And every day, God is our provider. Almighty God, our warrior, our strength, and our shield. God is our strong tower and a place of refuge to run to in times of trouble. He is a high hill in which we can hide from our enemies. And he is our mighty fortress in which we can resist the devil who is here in our world to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So God our Father is our provider, our almighty God, our healer, and the banner and authority in which we daily face off with the devil. God the Father is our peace. Look with me at Judges 6, just past Deuteronomy. Joshua Judges, pardon me, just past Joshua. Joshua Judges. <coughs> Judges 6, 21 through 24. God is our peace. 21 through 24, and I'll read then the angel of the Lord put out the, the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and unleavened bread and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, named it the Lord his peace. To this day, it is still in the Ophrah of the Mizraites. This is one of my favorite stories in the, in the Old Testament about Gideon. He was not a great leader. Uh, he was really more or less the poorest of the poor. He trembled literally at the thought of God calling him to lead an army or do anything in for, for God's glory. But you know what? What really impresses me is that he did it anyway. Uh, and he and the story of here is where you remember he was you heard the story about putting out your fleece. Well that's this this story. That's the end of the story, that part of the story. Gideon needed peace and he needed it from God to know what to do next. And and as I read over that it reminded me, don't we do that every day? Pam, you ever want peace? Lois, you ever want peace? Don't we need that instead of chaos? Comfort and mercy instead of complaining and judgment. Here are five verses that that's, Kathy's going to put up on the screen for us. That remind us that God gives us peace. Beginning in Proverbs 16. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Isaiah 26.3 you shall keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
John 14, 27, in the last, uh, supper, in the, the last Supper. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33, Jesus said these things. I have spoken to you that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, by thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Church family, God our Father is our provider. He is our strength and shield. He is our strong tower and a place of refuge. He is the God who heals and shows mercy. God is the banner under whom we live our daily lives and to whom we owe our allegiance in every obedience. God is our peace. He is our hope and he is our way of salvation. 2 Samuel 22. Please turn there. Joshua Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. From the four kings. Second Samuel 22, almost at the end of that chapter of that book. Verses 2 through 7. I'm going to go ahead and read. It's on the screen. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God and, who, and from the temple he heard my cry. And my cry for help came into his ears. The horn of salvation, or the horn, was used to call the, to rally the people together. They would blow the ram's horn, and they used it in battle to announce the attack. And there are many verses in the Old Testament testifying to the strength and glory of God as the horn of our salvation. Because God's power rallies the people together to bring them to their safety and to love and to hope and to peace. It was even used in, in Luke 1.69. As the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write that God raised up a Savior, the horn of salvation, to bring eternal life to all who believe in Him. Church family, you can absolutely believe with perfect peace that God knows what is going on in your life right now. He knows your needs. He knows how to supply them. And He knows how to take care of you. But there is a caveat. There's a hook. It's the same with you and me as well. Now, if you're like me, I love to spoil my grandchildren. But when they misbehave, which isn't very often, they're pretty perfect. If they misbehave, I am not going to give in to them and give them what they want. For instance, if they were misbehaving all morning long, and you had them and you they were driving you crazy. All of a sudden they turned to you and said, we want to go to the Purple Cow and eat and we want you to drive us to Grapevine to play putt-putt golf this afternoon. After having endured all morning long their misbehavior, are you likely to go out in the June or July afternoon weather and play putt-putt golf in the afternoon 100 degree weather? I wouldn't. God blesses us, and he, and he loves us immensely. But, but the Bible tells us to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is older, then he will not depart from it. There's a discipline that needs to be there. There's a, there's a, a responsibility that we have to train up children in discipline on, on, on the levels of understanding that they have. God's provision, his protection, and his blessing comes to us not only as our Heavenly Father, but it comes to us as rewards for our obedience 
and to his commandments and the teachings of Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. If we will teach them discipline and we will discipline ourselves, God will reward us and bless us and take us to places that we would never dream of. If God doesn't have time, have to spend time correcting us, then he can spend time blessing us and being our provider and being our sustainer. And God is all the names that we have shared today, but he is not a doormat that you can walk on. Just because you want something doesn't mean that God's going to hand it out to you. He's not a vending machine that you can pop in a prayer and out pops whatever it was that you wanted in the first place. God is indeed Jehovah Jireh. He is El Shaddai, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, and Jehovah Shalom, peace. And he is, and, and he is more importantly, our God, our Creator, and the Lord of our salvation, who represents not only our strength and refuge, but He is the one who gave up His only begotten Son and planned from the beginning of time to provide us with the way of salvation to come and live in heaven with Him for all of eternity. So I simply end my, my sermon today this way. I've shared with you this morning the truth of the gospel. As I've shared with you out of God's word, and it deserves a response. Whatever that response is, is up to you. You can sit there and pray and thank God and praise God. You can uh, ask for help. You can pray uh, at the altar. You can come meet me down front. I'll assist you in any way that I can. But when we share the gospel, I always give you a chance to respond in any way you want to. You can stand and sing with Paul uh, and the music of, uh, that uh, Sharon and uh, Susan plays for us. But I thank you for uh, your response to the gospel. Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, we come to you as sheep in a world that, would, that it opposes us. It is the most insane, unbelievable truth that people in this world oppose us as Christians. For whatever silly reason, I don't understand. It's not the Christians that are breaking into schools and causing harm. It's not the Christians who are knocking down buildings. It's not the Christians who are painting on, on, uh, on uh, clinic walls. I, I, I just pray, Father, that you will guard our hearts and lives. That you will reward us for our obedience. That you will lead us through our circumstances. Thank you, God, that you are our peace and our hope, that you are almighty God, that we live under your banner and your authority every day. Serving you is an honor and a privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.